The story today is the fifth chapter of the contemplative life. And whatever it brings out in us. And I think next week we'll go right ahead into the sixth chapter of contemplative life. I'm really anxious to get through with it so we can move into Joel's next book, The Mystical Eye, all prepared for it. When we have finished this book, we will have what may be called the foundation of the transcendental consciousness. We should be at a place where we can, without flinching an eyelid, be aware of the nothingness of all error, without taking thought about it. This book should be for us a preparation for that consciousness which needs take no thought about the problems of the world and of the body without having to sit down and intellectualize about it. There is such a consciousness. At times you find you're in it at other times, you have to rise up from the valley. A friend of mine said the other day, sometimes he feels that he's walking up the down escalator. And we all know that unless we are continuously moving up, 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 the moment we stop, the consciousness of the world takes us right down back where we started and sometimes even further back. But there is a top. It's the landing, the momentary mountain top. And on that top, there's Goliath out there, but he doesn't stand a chance. It's an unfair fight. Poor Goliath could never win because you stand in a different consciousness in which Goliath, to you, is actually nothing. Not a giant, not a bully, not an insurmountable thing in front of you, taunting you, telling you you can't get by. But your Goliath has been conquered and you're ready for new things. Now, according to the morning paper, Mr. William Randolph Hearst, Jr. has provided us with a little sidelight to today's lesson. He is expressing the fear that Russia is getting there quicker in the arms race than we are. He is seeing his Goliath, and he is pointing out to us that we must fear and outrace that Goliath. And if anyone were to say to Mr. Hurst, or those who share his opinion, that they have no faith in the Bible, they would throw up their arms and say, what are you talking about? We're God-fearing men. But what about what God says in the Bible? Do you accept it? Oh, yes. Well, what about David and Goliath? And what about your story this morning? Let's look at the story and then let's look at David and Goliath and see the difference in the mind of man typified by the Hearst story and the mind of spirit typified by the words speaking through Samuel to us about a man who's in a vision enables him to walk through an insurmountable object without taking arms. Mr. Hurst says, Today the U.S. Bomber Force is less than 600. Our sub-launched missiles have numbered 650 for four years, and our land-based missiles have totaled 1,054 for four years, and during the same time, the Soviet bomber force has remained about constant. 
but their submissile force has grown to almost 400 launchers and is expected to overtake ours in two or three years. And meanwhile, the Soviet land-based intercontinental force has risen to over 1,440 operational launchers. More on the way. And so, while the Soviets are gaining and will soon exceed us in missile weaponry at sea, we have already fallen distinctly behind on land. Now, that's a very imposing series of statistics, and I'm sure it'll make the Pentagon do something very quickly. But, of course, you realize that the Pentagon reads the Bible, too, and believes in it. And therefore, we must see that people can read this Bible and believe in it while their actions are completely opposed to what they believe. According to this, the David and Goliath story should have been written another way, perhaps. David should have looked out and said, Oh, look at that giant. And look at that armor. And look at the weapons. Now, let's see. How can I go out and fight him? What we need to do is get together and build better weapons. We have to outpower him. Or perhaps outsmart him. Or we need a great general to outflank him. We must do something physically or mentally. That would be the Bible version if it meant us to outpower Russia or outpower other nations. But the Bible version says, not by might, not by power, by my spirit. And really, the greatest observation you will ever find on the David and Goliath story is in the fifth chapter of Contemplative Life. Because without a lot of fanfare, without a lot of psychology, Joel has given us not only the secret of David and Goliath, but the secret of the transcendental consciousness that we can live in. We're going to trace that because in order to understand his secret and the secret of Samuel and the secret of David and the secret of Christ Jesus, it isn't enough to see that a little fellow went out with a slingshot and that we can do the same. We must see what went inside the consciousness of David. What is the inner David doing while the outer David is overcoming this insurmountable object. And very nicely, once we start to look at what the inner David is doing, the scripture tells us precisely that. Practically every line tells you what's going on in David's consciousness. And it's a perfect blueprint for us of the path to what David eventually becomes. He becomes a king. Goliath is just one stepping stone on the way. As you move past Goliath, there are going to be other Goliaths. Let's not pretend that the moment he got past Goliath, everything was roses. He got through four or five wives too. He got through many things on the way all part of his spiritual path. He lost one whom he loved very dearly. He lost Jonathan. And you will notice that he even lost his own followers. But always, this invisible path of spirit gives us the outer signs and if we're looking we recognize them and we make them part of our continuing developing awareness of truth. We find right out that David was tending the sheep. We know that Christ Jesus later said, I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. 
We know that he said to Peter, If you love me, feed my sheep. David was feeding the sheep, tending the sheep. Now this is a sign then, a symbol to us, that he is in the preparatory stage of initiation. He is the one of eight sons. He's the eighth. And he is the youngest. He is in a far country. He's not in his own kingdom at the moment. The king of this country is Saul, the king of Israel. And now we have Israel pitted against the Philistines. And shall we say then that mind and body are having a little war. But Saul looks with some degree of favor upon David. And so something is happening that will make David the champion on the side of Israel, on the side of mind, coming into a higher sense called soul. And on the other side, their champion, the champion of physical force, of the body of man, of the base nature of man, is the incarnate evil called Goliath. Two champions, one representing body, one representing that emergent awareness of soul, coming above the level of mind. Now, before we go any further, you're able to see that Goliath represents the old man of yesterday. David represents the new. Actually, there are many facets to Goliath, and they change as you change. At one point, Goliath will represent to you the accumulated karma of your entire life all standing out in front of you, saying you can't go any further. At another stage, Goliath will only represent a momentary problem. But one thing that Goliath does represent always is this. Goliath is not an external obstacle. Goliath is not an external condition blocking your path. Goliath represents the complete fullness of your own false sense of self. This Goliath that we encounter in Scripture is your second self. David is your emergent, real self, becoming self-aware, lifting you out of the false belief in a second self. And every problem, every pain, every ache, every evil, every form of darkness, lack, and limitation, every belief in anything finite is included in this Goliath, this present sense of self. And when you look out at a problem, we learn you're not looking out at a problem, you're looking at the Goliath of the false sense of self which says, here's the problem, and here's what it's going to do to you if you don't watch out. The problem is never external to your being, it is always the Goliath of your false sense of self standing in front of you, looking down at you, saying, here's what we have to face today. Goliath is not your enemy out there. Goliath is mortal mind in you, making this vast image of an impregnable armor which says you cannot defeat me. You may be recovering from an accident. 
and your mind can't figure out how in the world this condition which is settled into a seemingly permanent condition can ever be overcome. And so you study spiritually and you study and you study. You're walking up that down escalator and getting nowhere. Sometimes it seems I've got it. Other times you're back at the bottom looking up. Goliath still says, but it did happen. The bone said this way, you can't do anything about that now. It's done. It's finished. And your Goliath there is the belief that it happened. Because if it happened, when it happened, God wasn't there. And that situation has never happened. In other words, Goliath is your hypnosis in the material events of the past as an accepted reality. Yes, there is a way to overcome the hypnosis of the past as well as the present and the future. And all of that is Goliath, the braggart standing over us, putting fear into our hearts and telling our minds, you can't figure out this one. All of this is said when we are told about the size, the stature, the scowl, the armor, the loud, ominous voice. And all of this is contrasted by a quiet little fellow who is feeding the sheep. Just a young fellow with a ruddy countenance, a child, you might say. But somehow... He doesn't hear the braggart as others do. Because living in the inner self, feeding the sheep, resting in the consciousness of God's presence, he develops the capacity to see with the eyes of God. To see no evil, to hear no evil, to speak no evil. Goliath. It's almost hard to focus upon this fellow. Goliath. Did God make such a creature? Did God make anything destructive? Did God create a problem? Goliath, who can this be? A nothingness not created by the Father. But who is David? Is David a nothingness too? Yes, he is a nothingness. He's as much a nothingness as Goliath. There's no David there. There's no Goliath there. And only David is aware of that. I am the light, said the Master Jesus. And now David is realizing himself to be the light of God. Because having fed the sheep, the consciousness has developed to the point where light, spirit, substance, essence, is the identity of David and the identity of Goliath. All that is present in the pure consciousness is the true identity of spirit. There are not two forms and nothing more. There are two body images standing in the one invisible light. And who is the majority but the one who knows this? Now David, 
being an initiate of truth and Goliath representing that force in him which stands in his way to the kingship or Christhood is really waging an inner conflict which has nothing to do with other people or other events this is the change of consciousness within David made visible this is spiritual consciousness manifesting outwardly as outer events but you're going to discover as we go along a little further that the language of the soul is what we're looking at we're looking at these symbols appearing as body images and body conditions and world conditions that are put forth by consciousness as it is accepted or rejected. And all that we are witnessing now is the acceptance within David that the kingdom of God is within himself. that his spirit is omnipresent spirit that his omnipresent spirit stands where Goliath appears to be he cannot deny omnipresence and accept the intimidation of Goliath at the same time once he has accepted Goliath as a reality a force of destruction he is saying omnipresence is a lie. Spirit is a lie. Spirit is not here. The power of spirit is not here. And as a human being, this is precisely what he would do. But having been tending the sheep, having had that spiritual beginning within himself, and that rising knowledge of the inner Christ, All the strength, all the power of the kingdom in his consciousness must manifest in some way as the non-power of Goliath. And the great vision that came through Joel about this is the secret of your work. It is something that is not explained by any of the religions of the world because until no power is accepted you cannot explain David and Goliath except in the usual cliches. No power here means just this. God being the only presence anywhere Only the perfect power of God is functioning. And when you are trying with the mind to cope with that thought, you find you're unable to support it for a long time. You can memorize it, and you can try to jot it on a card so that tomorrow you remember it you can try to hammer it into yourself with a recitation but it isn't enough non-power has to be a state of consciousness attainable in which you are able to know that because God is everywhere There is no power needed in any circumstance on this earth. Now, that may manifest as a boy with a slingshot casting a stone on the forehead of a giant. And 
And you'll say, well, he did something. He didn't exert no power. He did something. Yes, only because if he did absolutely nothing, it would not be as it is in actual human living. You would have no way of understanding what was happening. In human living, you would be putting on the armor and going out to face this giant. In human living, you would face your adversary and you would usually use the identical tactics of your adversary. You'd want to match him brain for brain, brawn for brawn, strategy for strategy. That's not the spiritual way. The spiritual way is first within yourself and within himself David knew no power was needed to overcome this adversary no power needed no armor no sword the slingshot the five stones become symbols to teach us in fact, if he had gone out with a sword and armor, you wouldn't have heard the story again. He'd have been annihilated. If he met his adversary with the tactics of the adversary, if you meet the liar with a lie, the cheat with a cheat, the force with a force, you're just locking horns. You're recognizing it as a reality. And here this vast monumental figure compared to the little boy is shown to be nothing but a mirage. An externalized belief. The sum total of all human fear externalized into one mammoth figure. With no substance no content, no power, unless he has an adversary who believes he has power. And when you translate this to every problem in your life, you find you are really saying that every problem in your life is without substance, without power, is nothing but your externalized belief made visible as condition, thing, person, adversary, who needs to be faced only by the little David in you with a slingshot, meaning inner vision. For that which finally makes the giant succumb is the stone of truth. One little stone of truth and the giant is slain. This is the eternal warfare between all of the material grotesque problems of the world and your one little stone of spiritual truth. And what is that spiritual truth which makes it possible for you to stand in the consciousness of no power? Only spirit exists. There is only spirit. I am the light. You are the light. These forms of a world mind are not substance. These are shadows in the light. And the consciousness of light as your name, your substance, your being, the awareness of the omnipresence of the light worked with, and that's feeding your sheep, living with it. And every time a thought runs out of line, you bring that thought back into the fold. 
with your rod of truth so that every little sheep, every little thought that moves outside into fear, hate, rejection, resentment, material thinking is a lost sheep and you gently bring it back into the fold you are feeding the sheep of your mind until all that is in there is the truth that spirit is spirit is spirit is does spirit have pain no does spirit have any problem no does spirit suffer does spirit have a heart attack is spirit blind is spirit deaf does spirit die the spirit have anything that we encounter in the world as a problem is spirit all and every little sheep that says there's something besides spirit has to be brought back into the fold in your consciousness until all your sheep are in the fold until spirit is your consciousness now where's Goliath just one of the little sheep. Just one of the little sheep who got too big because he wasn't watched. And now we look at Goliath. He's not quite as big anymore. He is shrunken some. Spirit is. And he's been telling you how powerful he is. He's been denying that spirit is the only power. He's been telling you what he's going to do to you if you ever dared to come out on the battlefield with him. But spirit is all that is here. Spiritual identity is yours, and that spiritual identity is omnipresent. There are no opposites in spirit. There are no Goliaths in spirit. There are no rushes in spirit. But you'll never know this until you know there's no David in spirit either. As long as there's a David, there's a Goliath. As long as there's a personal me, there's a Goliath. But when I am spirit, Goliath was just shot murdered, killed, annihilated. He never existed. The absence of personal sense in me is the end of Goliath because that's who Goliath was. My personal sense is Goliath. When I know I'm spirit, the slingshot has found its mark. Truth has conquered Goliath. All the problems were in Goliath. When I know I am spirit, the problems contingent upon the existence of a personal self are no longer there. You cannot find a problem in spirit. And when you have accepted spirit as the all, as the self, as the self without beginning or end in time or space, as the self everywhere now, you're in the consciousness that needs no power. We have to illustrate that for you. The dog bites the boy. The mother is worried. The shot is given to the boy for rabies. There's a day, a 14-day period before you really know. So you wait. Goliath says the boy can have rabies. Mother says we have to watch out, the boy can have rabies. Medicine says the boy can have rabies. There's a power called rabies where there is no awareness that spirit is all. Now then, this comes to your attention. 
and you are aware that spirit is all. Goliath is standing before you. Maybe to you it's not much of a Goliath anymore, but it is to that mother. And behind it all is rabies, the threat, the possibility. Why, even the other day, a boy in the paper passed on from rabies. So she's worried. Now, none of us should have that worry. Because if you are feeding your sheep, if you are living in the consciousness of truth, that spirit is all, you will be in the consciousness which can say, really can say and know without any great effort, but instinctively and automatically, there is no dog, there is no boy, there is only spirit. There can be no rabies. And in that consciousness you have fulfilled the first two points of your healing consciousness. The knowledge of the non-reality of the Goliath called matter, the non-reality of the Goliath called condition in matter. That is impersonalizing and nothingizing just by being in the consciousness that spirit is all. You automatically do not go into a long wind-up, a long harangue, and a long series of quotations. It comes to you and you simply know spirit being all, there is no material selfhood and no material condition. And there's nothing to figure out. There's nothing to argue about. There's nothing to affirm or deny beyond that. It's simply a knowing because you have been living in the consciousness that spirit is all. And sometimes you don't have to go any further. It's better to. The third step. And that third step now is something I want you to take because you've done it enough so that it can become routine. A great joy, but something that you don't have to fumble to find. There is no dog. There is no boy. If you can't face that quickly, easily, effortlessly, you've got work to do. But it can be faced that way. And then you see, you have nothing to fight against anymore. You don't have to fight Goliath anymore. As far as you're concerned, Goliath doesn't have to die. He never existed. You don't have to cure the rabies. I mean now, this must be that consciousness right then and there, and it takes daily living with it to be right then and there in that consciousness. If there's the slightest fumbling and trying to untalk yourself from the problem, you've lost it right there. Now then, if you can look at your financial problem the same way, a physical problem, your human relationships, anything in your life as an impossibility because spirit is all there is. And stay with that for days until something in you accepts it, something in you refuses to accept another substance in this world and spirit. When you reach that conclusion that spirit is, and that's what Jesus was teaching, that spirit is all there is, and that's why spirit is invincible. That's why spirit needs no power to overcome matter. That's why spirit is never needing another power to overcome any material condition. Spirit is, 
and the accident out there, the problem out there, hitting your consciousness doesn't make a dent, doesn't cause a reaction. It isn't that you steal yourself and your great willpower, but rather you simply know. It just hits you and that's the end of it. It doesn't make a dent. Now you're in a non-reactive stage which automatically is called impersonalizing and nothingizing. You haven't done anything except you know. And we know that spirit being all, I need no power. Now if we can get that far, your down escalator is going to cease to have power to bring you down. Let's stand there for a minute in the knowledge that spirit is the substance of God. That God is spirit and God is all and spirit is the only substance and we're working behind the visible scenes in the one substance which is spirit which is the power of perfection and love and it is always present it is always self-maintaining, self-supporting. And then the Bible says, whatever you ask in my name shall be given. Accept yourself to be that spirit. And we're in the third step. That spirit, which is all, is my name, my substance. And because that spirit is omnipresent and I am that spirit, my substance is omnipresent. I am omnipresent. My substance is everywhere. The power of my substance must be where my substance is. We're accepting omnipresence of God everywhere and therefore the omnipotence of God must be where his substance is. Everywhere is God's spirit. Everywhere is God's power. Now these are the facts. We're not concerned about appearances. We're in the third step of the healing consciousness. The power and the presence of God is everywhere. And that substance, which is the presence and power of God, is my substance. Everywhere. The fourth step puts the whole thing together. It's total freedom. The fourth step is that substance is here now. You take it here now in your consciousness and that's all you do. Here now is that substance, that power, that presence, that spirit which is God. And because it's there, I don't have to do anything about it. It's here and if I touch it here, I'm touching it everywhere in this universe right now. All the Goliaths in the world can just waste their time. They aren't there. The substance that I'm touching here is the only substance that is there. The spirit that is here is the only spirit that is there. And because spirit is all and has no material opposite, only spirit is there. Only spirit is everywhere. But I must touch it here in the kingdom of God within me. Here I know, accept spirit as identity, and the power, the presence of that spirit which is here being everywhere becomes the law unto me. That's the secret of no power, isn't it? What power need I have over an adversary if spirit is all there is? And I have seen no one in this world give us that understanding of David and Goliath except Joel. No power. Just standing in the knowledge, spirit is everywhere as itself, and that self is myself here.
That heals rabies, I can tell you right now. It removes the belief in rabies right here, and that absence of belief right here becomes the absence of belief wherever necessary, wherever there has been a contact to this awareness that rabies is non-existent, that only spirit is. No power is needed to overcome it. None. No power is needed to overcome a problem on this earth. Though real, it is only real to the one who still has not accepted the allness of spirit, the identity of spirit, the omnipresence of spirit. And so in review, the one, two, three, four of it is this. You're doing two jobs in one. You're impersonalizing and nothingizing when you come to the place where you can know that only spirit is. It takes some people five years to come to that. Only spirit is. There is no material form and no material condition because of the fact that only spirit is. You can take Jesus and see how simple it was for him having reached the conclusion that only spirit is to stand looking out at every material claim and yawning so that he'd only need spittle to restore the awareness of vision. Only spirit is, where did vision go? Where did hearing go? Where did all of the good things go if only spirit is? They were lost in false belief. Goliaths accepted because the human mind is the very Goliath presenting all of the false beliefs. And so everywhere is this condition in spirit? Is there a cripple in spirit? Is there lack and limitation in spirit? Is spirit hungry? Is spirit poor? Is spirit needful of something? Is spirit suffering or dying? Is spirit going to live just a certain number of years? Is spirit getting older? Does spirit need protection? And you find none of these things are true. Spirit needs none of this, and spirit lacks nothing. And you're strong. You're at the consciousness which knows this, and so you're up to the third step. You're in that non-reactive consciousness which can smile and say, but only spirit is. And you're in the third step of, and it is I. I am spirit. Where is spirit? Everywhere. Everywhere. Spirit is omnipresent. Therefore, that omnipresent spirit is myself. I'm no longer this finite material self. I am that omnipresent spirit, which is I and which is the fourth step here, now. And that here now is the trigger which unites you to omnipresent spirit everywhere, standing in the need for no power, letting the spirit do its own revelation of harmony and truth and perfection. You're in the Sabbath. Rest. Stand ye still. Wait upon the Lord. Let the Lord of hosts show forth that the braggart named Goliath is just a huge bag of wind.
And that personal sense of self, which is a source of every other Goliath you're going to face, being dead, why, the source is gone. The personal sense is crucified. You've really gone through the crucifixion and the resurrection with the slaying of Goliath. Personal sense, slain, you're resurrected unto reality, you hold it a while, and in your Sabbath you ascend over the material appearance. Every time you face another so-called problem with the truth, you go through crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. So that your crucifixion is to crucify the false beliefs by knowledge of spirit as the all. Your resurrection is when you stand in the truth of being that I am that spirit. And your ascension is when you are standing in the Lord, in the self, in the no power of pure spirit you ascend above the appearance. When you keep doing this again and again and again, you find you have the weapon to meet anything with no power. And then David and Goliath becomes a very valuable teaching for those on the path to kingship or Christing. Now, I think the uh, healing consciousness should be quite clear by now. We should have solid ground to stand on. The importance of it is that when we have attained this measure of freedom, we don't waste valuable energy and thought and time pushing things away and fighting adversaries, we can devote that time and that energy to dwelling in the spirit, to living in the truth, to walk with God. And thereby you find you're automatically living in cause instead of fighting off the effects of a mortal mind. When you're living in cause, you're sowing to the spirit. You're building with substance. You're making a real transition in consciousness. And the physical form is going to lose its effect. It's going to become just another Goliath as you become aware of that other body of light which has no outer obstructions to face which isn't looking at the calendar which knows nothing of the evils of the world now this is the place we're all at in varying degrees, but nonetheless, this is the focus from which we're all working. Now, let's assume we had all reached the point where every Goliath in the world would meet the consciousness of no resistance in the knowledge that only spirit is. At that moment, you are in what may be called the point of equilibrium between the finite and the infinite, between the unreal and the real, between the spirit and the material. That point of equilibrium is the secret place of the Most High where you walk undisturbed. And having attained it in a measure, holding it in a measure, we learn where to live there at the point of equilibrium which is the secret place of the Most High, and you'll find that is where my peace is. 
I give you my peace at that point of equilibrium where there is nothing which is responding to the material world's complaints, which is sowing to the spirit, which has built the confident assurance of spiritual identity under spiritual law everywhere, which has accepted that God is conscious always, present always, power always, love always, harmony always, perfection always and everywhere. The miracle of life begins at that point. That is where we walk on a new firmament and we discover the old earth was really a symbol of our old body. The new earth is our new body of spirit which is infinite and we are that infinite spiritual body called the new earth. We're on a different scale of things. There's no personal self now to be concerned about as we were before. There's no personal self to be made into a success or to protect. That's yesterday's Goliath. You'll find that David put his armor in the tent after. He knew he would never need that armor to wear. The new consciousness was formed. The armor was within, in the tent. The knowledge of self places you on the new firmament. To walk in the spirit is to walk in the acceptance that I live in the cause of reality. And cause and effect are one. Cause being spirit and being perfect, effect must be one with that cause and always perfect. And therefore, I am not concerned. I live in obedience to the impulse of spirit. Goliath may eventually show forth again in another form and then another but the ultimate death of Goliath is assured. The moment you have reached this level which says spirit can never be less than its own present perfect self in all things. Then I would suggest that you make a little card Get yourself a handful of index cards. And every time you come to a major truth, something you know is a landmark for you, something you've got to be able to wake up to tomorrow and be part of yourself without any effort, such as only spirit is present. When you have the realization of that, the knowledge of it, the, under, the working understanding of it, put it on your index card. Only spirit is present. Nice big bold letters. Put that card in your pocket. Put it in your purse. Keep it on your person wherever you are. Occasionally just pull it out and look at it. Only spirit is present. until this is your knowledge within, until it's carded inside yourself, until you know only spirit is present. So that you can quickly look at any situation without having to intellectualize about it and stand ye still in the knowledge that 
only spirit is present. And then wait inside. And this is where that glorious feeling becomes the revelation of divine power. Because only spirit is present, you find something within you seems to move to wherever the predicament is. And right there where the predicament seems to be, even though it may be miles away from where you are, within yourself it seems such a short distance, just a, a foot away. And from where the predicament seems to be in the outer, within yourself that predicament seems to disappear 